Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, Frequently Asked Questions Friday. Um, before we get started with our interview, uh, let me mention a couple things. Uh, first of all, we are having our Fiesta Texas Summer Giveaway. It started today. The winner will be announced July 12th. Uh, the prizes are uh, four tickets to Fiesta Texas and a parking pass and a $50 uh, gift card. Uh, or I guess that is the prize. Uh, see our Facebook page for more details. Um, also, we want to remind everybody of our scholarship. Uh, you can go to our website, uh, look at our scholarship page, and uh, that's going to end on December uh, 1st of this year. The first place winner that writes the best essay gets $2,500. The second place gets $1,500. And third place gets $1,000. So just go to hermanherman.com and uh, look, look at our scholarship page and you'll get all the details. Uh, finally, I wanted to remind everybody, uh, early voting is still going on for the special election. This is the 27th district, congressional district, the one that Blake Ferenfold uh, advocated. Uh, and uh, it's basically winner take all. Whoever gets more than 50% will be the uh, uh, our congressional uh, representative uh, until January. Uh, so the voting locations um, are on the Noises County uh, District Parks website. We'll we'll put a link on Facebook. But for instance, the courthouse, which is uh, this about this time of day, there's nobody at the Noises County Courthouse. So if you want to go by there, it's pretty easy to to go vote. Um, it's five to five, and it'll be five to five, I believe, all next week also. Also, this Saturday voting at the courthouse, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., and then Election Day, which is June 30th, which is next Saturday, uh, the polls will be open 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. But, you know, if you don't want to wait that long, then I encourage you, please go early vote. If you can't make it today during the week or next week, then... Um, Go tomorrow, and worst case scenario, go uh, go next Saturday. Um, let's start taking America back. All right, uh, today we got Josh Hopkins. Hi, uh, hey. um, Josh is a lawyer. Has been with us since about a year. About a year. Mm -hmm. All right, I've right, been with us a year. Um, and Josh mainly does products liability. Um, he does some mid mile and some eighteen wheelers and. Anything else you'd say you, you kind of specialize uh, in or focus on? Recently done a bit of employment law to okay. with the city case. That's right. Yeah. So Josh and Daniel working on the, the case against the city of Corpus Christi for not paying the workers for being on, on call. Right. Um, not paying them the overtime they're supposed to get. Um, anything else? You uh, just got back from Atlanta for the media, uh, arbitration we had from Ty Brooks case. Mm -hmm. there. That was interesting. Yeah, I want to tell us real quick about the Brooks case. Yeah, Mr. Brooks is an actor who was on Desperate Housewives and several other TV series and whatnot. He got in a bad accident. Mm -hmm. And uh, he made a claim, actually on his own insurance policy, which was denied. He so said, we went out in arbitration and had a hearing in an arbitration rather than a trial for a day long presenting his case. And, Essentially, he missed out on some opportunities for some movies that we could have been in. Yeah, and like you were in arbitration because the insurance policy required you to go right, to arbitration. Right, right. It required arbitration. Okay. So we had no choice. We, the jury couldn't hear this case. We had to go to arbitration. No. So we did that this week. So anyway, he was so no. So what happened? So he missed out on some movies. And yeah. So he was going. He was up for for World War Z. He was up for Django Unchained, and I think. He was up for uh, two other movies or so, and missed out on the opportunity to, to read for those movies and get those roles because of his injuries. Because of his injuries, yeah. Okay. And so this was a this was an uninsured or underinsured motorist claim. Uninsured, yeah. Uninsured. The person that hit him had some insurance. Now yeah. it wasn't enough insurance to cover his loss, mm -hmm. so we were arbitrating this with the insurance. Okay. And. Uh, so what, when do y'all hear from the arbitrator? I hope by August. By August, August yeah. yeah. Takes that long. Takes that long. Yeah. Okay. 
Jerry's a little bit quicker than that. Yeah, Jerry's so. quicker than that. You know that day, right? <laughs> Jerry, you don't get to know that day because he gets to he gets to decide that. But it was interesting. You know, it's the first time I ever represented an actor. Yeah. Um, yeah. And he's a really nice guy, and you know, it's a shame what happened to him. But but he really appreciated the help that we gave him. Yeah. Good. Let's hope we get a good result. Yeah. All right. So we were just going to talk a little bit about product liability. Um, any particular case you'd like to talk about, or in particular uh, um, incident, or well, I mean, I guess in the news lately, there's been some issues with these Tesla, the Tesla vehicle, the electric car, right? Which is a new technology, um, and there's been some litigation involving the autopilot feature in the vehicle and people sort of overly trusting technology to drive their car and getting in accidents in cases where the uh, Self-driving feature, say, didn't see a, an 18 wheeler pulling across the highway, and the car ran right into the side of the 18 wheeler. In one case, that I'm familiar with. And so, there's been some litigation involving those type of technologies They're called collision avoidance technologies or CATs. It's a new technology. It's got some bugs, and the bugs are coming out, and people are getting injured and killed because of problems with that technology. So, in a case like that, um, I I guess the Tesla manufacturer would say it's your fault because you shouldn't have over relied on this and tried to let the car drive for itself. Would that be kind of their defense? Well, that might be their defense, but of course they put that technology out and represent to the public that it's a safe technology and that's ready for prime time when perhaps it really isn't ready for prime time yet. Uh, and so if, if the product is defective and unreasonably dangerous, it's what we have to prove in court then the company is responsible for that effective and dangerous product. So, what, what does that mean to mean to be unreasonably dangerous? Well, that is that it's more dangerous than the average maybe consumer would expect uh, for something to be dangerous. In, in other words, uh, everyone knows that that guns are dangerous, and that if you shoot a gun, it will you know, injure something, somebody. So you can't say a gun is unreasonably dangerous because it shoots bullets. And, Kills people. That, that's its intended purpose. That's what's intended purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Like a knife. But, if that, but if that same gun, when the person fires it, blows up in their face and injures the shooter, then it's unreasonably dangerous. Okay. So, and and what about um, defective product? What, what does that mean? Defective product. It basically means that the product has a defect, either in the way it was made, manufactured, or the way it was designed, the way it was meant to be that makes it dangerous so in other words a product might be might be specked out and designed uh such as maybe the battery in a tesla vehicle um it was designed to have a certain voltage a certain amperage or whatever um, and the actual one to put in the car didn't meet those specifications that might be a manufacturing defect, defect right. okay the other type of defect you can have is a design defect that would be the case where let's say the battery in a Tesla vehicle, the way they built it, the way they designed it, uh, is defective in some way because it doesn't have maybe a thick enough case on it to, to contain the battery in the case of, of an accident. Like that. that would be the next. That would be a defect. So there's two ways the product can be defective either by the way it's made or manufactured, or the way that it's designed. Oh, and there's something also that's a marketing defect. Yes, there's also marketing defects too. And, and what would be an example of marketing? Defect? That would be an example of where uh, someone manufactures a product and they say it has certain types of main qualities that it really doesn't have. And, you know, they represent the public, and the public has to rely on those those qualities of the product. So maybe like in this, and we're talking about the Tesla, maybe some salesman saying, hey, you know, you can let the car drive, drive you to the store and you can close your eyes and go to sleep. Or right. And, uh, and, and you can't. Yeah. Because it doesn't meet those those expectations. Now, would that be any kind of breach of contract or breach of warranty or implied warranty or anything like that? If, if the salesman were to say something like that. Yeah, I mean uh, that's part of product liability too. These breaches of warranty too. Okay. So if, if a product doesn't meet the warranties that are represented to it by the by the manufacturer to the consumer, uh, and, and breaches one of those warranties or doesn't live up to one of those warranties, that's another. Claim under product liability too. Those would be like express warning, right? And would they have to be like in writing or something? Yeah, express warning would be uh, uh, 
more and say, or maybe something's in writing or something is in, in, in writing, or is implied, the other type of warranty we have is an implied warranty, or something's implied to be uh, merchantable or sellable. Um, and then it lacks something that otherwise it should have. So, like, what would a, a, an example be of an implied warranty of merchantability? Well, an implied warranty might be in the case of a Tesla vehicle that if you buy it and you're driving down the road, that doesn't suddenly just burst into flames because the battery fails on it. It's implied that it's going to be a good product and that it's going to be not have defects in it. It won't just catch fire for no reason. Right. It won't just spontaneously combust. Right. Yeah. Yeah, cars aren't supposed to do that. Yeah, which is the problem that we had with some of these Tesla vehicles with the batteries catching fire. Uh, the battery is a lithium-ion battery, which is the same, very same battery that was in the Samsung phones that if you're flying an airplane and say, if you have a certain Samsung phone, you can't get on the airplane with it. Right. Because the batteries just kind of combust. All and, and that's the batteries they're putting in. That's the same batteries in, in the Tesla. Uh, and it's not to say that all lithium-ion batteries are bad, but they have, if there is a defect or is a short in a lithium-ion battery, they can catch fire and burn. So is that is that a design defect, or is that a manufacturing defect, or what, what's causing that? It, it can spontaneous be spontaneous. Like I think in the case of the, uh, of the uh, Samsung phones, I think it was a manufacturing issue with those phones, a manufacturing defect with the batteries. That was causing them to fail. And what about the test? The test. I think everybody may have seen that video on, been on the news where yeah. the, that. I guess he's a director or something in Hollywood, and his flames are just shooting out underneath his Tesla. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't know if that's um, if that's a matter of design or the manufacturer of those batteries. Of course, Tesla makes their own batteries. Uh, so they have that Gigafactory right out there in the desert. The so, day. so they're the manufacturer of the battery. Yeah, too. and the designer. And, so, and the designer. If there's a problem with it, they're responsible for it. In those cases, who who investigates those to see what the problem is, whether it's design or whether it's well, the uh, the uh, government does through the NTSB. Okay. I believe will investigate those matters, uh, and. Uh, now, is that only somebody gets injured, or yeah, someone's injured? Well, not yes, someone's injured in their investigation, and then, and then, and then, uh, of course, uh, uh, private lawyers sometimes investigate those cases, like 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 we did, right? Where someone comes to us and says, you know, I, I had cases involving uh, Ford cruise control, which is one problem that Ford had with the cruise control systems on some Ford trucks. Mm -hmm. uh, spontaneously, the truck catches fire, someone's garage and burns their house down. Right. Um, well, those were cases where Ford didn't alert anyone to the problem. We just sort of discovered the problem on our own when someone came and says, Hey, my vehicle just caught fire in my garage. Right. I don't know why. Yeah. And so then we did some investigation and we find through our investigation, through our own experts, that there's a problem with the vehicle. Yeah, manufacturers aren't usually real keen about telling everybody they, they have defective products. No, imagine. and sometimes they, uh, they have what's called a silent recall, um, which I had recently had with the, some Ford vehicles, some F-150s, where Ford had a problem with the spring in the door handles of certain F-150s um, and discovered that they were weak in some testing they had done. And the weak door spring was causing doors to fly open in accidents. The people to be thrown from the vehicles or being partially thrown from the vehicles. Um, and we, we discovered in, in the litigation this problem with the springs that Ford was aware of with a hit from the government, um, but quietly replaced that part. When people came in and had their doors serviced, they replaced the part without, without, without telling anyone. Without telling the government anything about it. What about the people? Did they tell the. They didn't tell the people either. The consumers, the no. customer, they didn't tell anybody? No, they kept it secret. It's called silent recall. Yeah. Uh, and we, so that's when manufacturers find out that they have a problem in their products. They don't want to tell the government about it. Right. So they secretly replace parts in their vehicles to fix the problem. Once a recall expires, is there any recourse on that? Uh, once a recall expires? Well, recalls really don't have an expiration date. An expiration date. So recalls don't have anything to do with product liability too much and what, what we do. Yeah. Um, well, it depends on what, what they're recalling it for. Yeah, but, so. and, and it, sometimes recalls happen too late. Um, you know, it's sometimes not at all. Right. Um, you know, sometimes recalls happen 
I've had cases where a person was injured uh, in, in an accident, and a, a week later they get the recall notice for the defect right. that's in the vehicle. Right. So, you know, we can't depend on the manufacturers to recall our vehicles. We can't depend on the government to, re to order the manufacturer to recall. Sometimes, you know, unfortunately, I'm involved way before the recall happens. Yeah. Uh, and usually the manufacturer knows even at that point. Does the case change or liability change or anything uh, if the recall comes before or after the uh, accident or the injury? Um, where, where the defect, at least our client has now discovered the defect because he's injured, he or she's injured. Well, that some of that, ha I mean, like a good example of that is the Takata airbags recalls. There, there's the, there's some arguments with the Takata, Takata airbag recall. For Takata, had these airbags that had basically deteriorated, and when they went off, shrapnel would go out and hit the hit the person mm -hmm. and injure them. So Takata uh, recalled these airbags of certain vehicles, certain manufacturers recalled them, but unfortunately there weren't enough replacements. Uh, but despite the fact that the manufacturers knew there was a defect in their vehicle, they didn't offer consumers the right to go park their vehicle and get a rental car. They allowed the consumers to continue to drive their, these vehicles that they know are defective because they've got these defective airbags right. in them, yeah. um, but they don't make enough parts you know, to fix them. So, in some cases, there were arguments made that if you had a defective Takata kind of airbag in your, in your vehicle and you got the recall notice and subsequently you were injured, that the manufacturer was even more responsible in that case because he should have provided you with a replacement car, a rental car maybe. So, she didn't have to drive this car that was defective, that they knew was defective and dangerous. Right. Or can't they blame the uh the consumer too and say, well, you should have, uh, you know, you should have mitigated your damages and you, you should have gone and parked your car and you should have gotten yourself in a rental car. Now, unfortunately, some people can't afford that. They're already making car payments on the car no. that they're driving and they just don't have the money. I mean, I guess they could walk or ride a bike, but sometimes that's not so feasible. <laughs> so oftentimes consumers don't have a choice in that matter. Right. Um, but the manufacturer who's got lots and lots of resources certainly could put the person in a rental car and you know and that was the argument that was made at some time during this Takata airbag litigation. Takata has since gone bankrupt now so um, it's pretty much over. Now is do they just do companies like Takata usually carry insurance for something like that or they're on their own or they usually uh, they typically manufacturers uh, such as Takata and the, and the big product manufacturers they are self-insured to a certain amount which is millions of dollars. In other words, they, they, they have set aside in their corporate reserves, say 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars. Right. Essentially, it's a deductible. Right. But over and above that, they are insured. So then it shouldn't matter whether they go bankrupt or not. As, well, well, they, as, long, as long as they pay out what they, they owe, then they're insured. Their insurance company will pick it up after that. Yeah, and they can't really go. Uh, none of these manufacturers, I don't know what happened to Takata, but I can tell you for the auto manufacturers, um, they have sufficient uh, resources and sufficient insurance. They're not going bankrupt over product claims. Okay, that's not going to happen. There's, there's enough there. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. Um, well, we're running out of time here. Um, let me, let me. Oh, I have one other question. Let me finish with this. Um, I know sometimes consumers have heard uh, that there's strict liability with, uh, with products. What, 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 is, what exactly does that mean, strict liability? Well, strict product liability is uh, is a concept in a law, and a law that says that even if a manufacturer designs and builds and sells a product that is, and they're not negligent mm -hmm. or at fault, they're responsible if the product is actually defective and they're really dangerous. So that's called strict product liability. In other words, it doesn't matter what their mindset was when they sold the product or even how careful they were when they manufactured it. They can be the world's best manufacturer and completely what we call not negligent. Or they act, they act as a reasonably prudent manufacturer would in putting this product out in the market, but it ends up hurting someone because it's defective and reasonably dangerous, then it was called strictly liable for it, regardless of their fault. Okay. And that's what the law is on product liability. But the product still has to be unreasonably dangerous. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, 
Okay. Well, I think that answers it. All right. Well, we we got a little bit longer than we normally do. We usually like to end after about fifteen minutes. But um, anyway, uh, well, uh, is this your first time doing this, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. We'll say hi to everybody. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, well, everybody, that is uh, that's it for uh, frequently asked questions Friday. We'll see you again next um, uh, next Friday, uh, same time, same channel. Um, don't forget to go vote if you're in this if you're in this area. You're in a special election. Um, Chris, do we have our link up on our Facebook page? In the comments. Okay, uh, we got a link up so y'all can go and look at uh, all the voting places and the. Um, and the times that uh, your your local voting place will be open, um, and don't forget to enter the the uh, contest for uh, the Fiesta Texas summer giveaway. And if you know anybody in school who needs some money, tell them to apply for the scholarship. Somebody's got to win, so we got a first, second, and third place. So uh, until next week, thank you.